the Battle of the Saints, or Battle of Dominica was an important naval battle that took place over four days, the 9th of April 1782 to 12 April 1782, during the American War of Independence, and was a victory of a British fleet under Admiral Sir George Rodney over a French fleet under the Comte de Grasse forcing the French and Spanish to abandon a planned invasion of Jamaica. The battle is named after the Saints, a group of islands between Guadeloupe and Dominica in the West Indies. The French fleet defeated here by the Royal Navy was the same French fleet that had blockaded the British Army during the Siege of Yorktown. The French suffered heavy casualties and many were taken prisoner including the Comte de Grasse. Four French ships of the line were captured as well as one destroyed. Rodney was credited with pioneering the tactic of breaking the line in the battle, though this is disputed. Origins In October 1781 a plan had been worked out between Admiral Comte de Grasse, commander of the French fleet in the West Indies, and Francisco Salvadra de Sangronas, General Bureau for the Spanish Indies, court representative and aide to the Spanish governor of Louisiana, Bernardo de Galvez. The strategic objectives of this plan were to guide the Franco-Spanish military forces in the West Indies to accomplish the following objectives, to aid the Americans and defeat the British naval squadron at New York, the capture of the British Windward Islands and the conquest of Jamaica. This plan became known as the de grasse Sarveda Convention and the first objective was essentially met with the surrender of the British Army under General Cornwallis at the Siege of Yorktown in September 1781. De Grasse and his fleet had played a decisive part in that victory, after which they then sailed to the Caribbean. On arrival in St. Domingue November 1781 he was given news that the plan was given the go-ahead to proceed with the conquest of Jamaica. Jamaica was the largest and most profitable British island in the Caribbean. In particular the commodity that stood out the most was sugar, it was more valuable to the British economy than the 13 American colonies. In a letter from King George III to Lord Sandwich he declared that he would risk protecting Britain's important Caribbean islands at the risk of Britain herself, and this was strategy implemented in 1779. Sugar made up 20% of all British imports and was worth five times as much as tobacco, as well as the gradual expulsion of the British from the West Indies by the French and Spanish. The conquest was to force a massive blow on the British economy. The invasion itself though was perceived in the courts at Paris and Madrid as an alternative to the Spanish and French attempts to take Gibraltar, which for two years had been a costly disaster. While de Grasse waited for reinforcements to undertake the Jamaica campaign, he captured Street Kit in February 1782. The rest of the Windward Islands Antigua, St. Lucia, and Barbayard still remained under British control while Admiral George Rodney arrived in the Caribbean theatre the following month having brought reinforcements. These included 17 ships of the line and gave the British a slight advantage in number. On 7 April 1782, de Grasse set out from Martinique with 35 ships of the line, including 250 gunships in a large convoy of more than 100 cargo ships, to meet with a Spanish fleet consisting of 12 ships of the line. In addition de Grasse was to rendezvous with 15,000 troops at St. Domingue earmarked for the conquest quest by landing on Jamaica's north coast. Rodney on learning of this then sailed from St. Lucia in pursuit now with 36 ships of the line the following day. The British ships by this time had hulls which had gone through a process known as copper sheathing, found to be a practicable means of protecting them from marine growth and fouling as well as salt water corrosion. The result of this was that the speed and sailing performance as a whole in good wind improved dramatically. Battle. On 9 April 1782, the copper-hulled British fleet soon caught up with the French who were surprised by their speed. De Grasse ordered the French convoy to head into Guadeloupe for repair, forcing him to escort 250 gunships and placing its fleet in line of battle in order to cover the retreat. 
the British fleet became separated from the centre and rear divisions and eight ships of their vanguard under Rear Admiral Samuel Hood, however, moved against de Grasse's retreating ships and waged a fight. After an inconclusive encounter in which both sides suffered damage, de Grasse soon realised that the main British fleet would soon be upon them. He broke off the engagement to return to protect the merchant convoy. In the following days the two fleets faced each other parallel but both sides kept their distance as they repaired their ships. On 12 April, the French were sighted a short distance away as the two fleets manoeuvred between the northern end of Dominica and the Saints. A French straggler, Zedi Acute Eli Acute, was spotted and was being chased by four British ships as de Grasse made for Guadeloupe. He bore up with his fleet to protect the ship which led him to Guadeloupe and at the same time Rodney recalled his chasing ships and made the signal for line of battle. Rear Admiral Hood's van division were still making repairs from the action three days earlier, so he directed his rear division under Rear Admiral Francis S. Drake, to take the lead. At 7.40 HMS Marlborough under Captain Taylor Penny, led the British line and opened the battle when he approached the centre of the French line. Having remained parallel with the French, the ships of Drake's division then passed the remaining length of de Grasse's line and the two sides exchanged broadsides, a typical naval engagement of this time. Breaking of the line as the battle progressed, the strong winds of the previous day and night began to temper and became more variable. As the French line passed down the British line, the sudden shift of wind let Rodney's flagship HMS Formidable and several other ships including HMS Duke and HMS Bedford, sail towards the French line. At 8 a.m. Formidable opened fire and engaged the French centre and as she slowed, Jewel de Grasse's flagship filled a Paris of 104 guns. The rest of the ships soon followed raking the French as they did so causing huge casualties amongst the soldiers and sailors. Around 9 a.m., Drake's rearmost ship, HMS Russell, cleared the end of the French fleet and hold wind and while his ships had taken some damage, they had inflicted a severe battering on them. With an hour the wind had shifted to the south and thus forced the French line to separate and bear to the west as it could not hold its course into the wind. This allowed the British to use their guns on each side of their ships without any fear of return fire from the front and rear of the French ships. They were passing between. The effect was more telling with the use of carronades which the British had just equipped nearly half their fleet. This relatively new weapon at close range was devastating. Glorieu was the first to be taken advantage of virtually a sitting duck. She was quickly pounded and dismasted by intense fire. Four French ships in the confusion began milling around, formidable turn to starboard and had brought its port guns to bear on them. As a result formidable sailed through the French line blasting her way through, this piercing was followed by five other British ships. At the same time Commodore Edmund Affleck to the south also immediately capitalised on the opportunity and led the rear most of the British ships through the French line inflicting significant damage. The French tried to restore order. Around 1.30 p.m., de Grasse signalled line on the port tack, but this was not fulfilled. He was soon battling Hood's 90-gun HMS Barfleur, with their formation shattered and many of their ships severely damaged. The French fell away to the southwest in small groups. Rodney attempted to redeploy and make repairs before pursuing the French. By 2 p.m. the wind freshened and a general chase ensued, and as the British pressed south they took possession of Glorieux and caught up to the French rear around 3 p.m. In succession, Rodney's ships had isolated the other three ships, CE Acute SAR which was soon totally dismasted and in flames, was captured by HMS Centaur. Hector, a complete dismastered wreck struck after having battled HMS Canada and HMS Alcide. Ardent soon followed being taken by the rest of the British centre. At 4 p.m. de Grasse with Vildo Paris, alone and being battered by Buffler, with little support and suffering huge losses in men made another attempt to signal the fleet. 
by ordering to build the line on the starboard tack, but again this was not fulfilled. By this time most of the French fleet apart from those surrounded had retreated. Louis Antoine de Bougainville who commanded August, succeeded in rallying eight ships of his own division. Finally the isolated Ville de Paris being overwhelmed and suffering horrific losses eventually struck her colours. Hood took the surrender and the boarding crew which included the British fleet surgeon Gilbert Blaine were horrified at the carnage, remarkably de Grasse appeared not to have a scratch on him while every one of his officers were either killed or wounded. Rodney boarded soon after and Hood then presented de Grasse to him. With his surrender the battle had effectively finished except for a few long-range vessel tree shots and the retreat of many of the French ships in disorder. With the fire now out of control the magazine aboard the CE Acute SAR exploded, killing over 400 French and 50 British sailors despite many of them jumping overboard. The Comte de Vaudreuil in Scepter learning of de Grasse's fate assumed command of the scattered French naval fleet. On 13 April he had ten ships with him and sailed towards Cap Francais. Aftermath the British lost 243 killed and 816 wounded, and two captains out of 36 were killed. The French loss in killed and wounded has never been stated, but of captains alone, six were killed out of 30. It is estimated that the French loss may have been as much as 3,000 and more than 5,000 French soldiers and sailors were captured. In addition to the captured French ships several of their ships were severely damaged. The large number shows what a considerable force the French were willing to put ashore with the invasion of Jamaica. Of the Ville de Paris crew, over 400 were killed and more than 700 were wounded more than the entire casualties of the British fleet. On 17 April, Hood was sent in pursuit of the French and promptly captured two 64 gun ships of the line and two smaller warships in the Battle of the Mona Passage. On 19 April, soon after the defeat, the French fleet reached Cap Francois in several waves. The main corps and of Audrey arrived on 25 April, Marseille Lois. Along with Hercule, Pluton and Evelé arrived on the 11th of May. In May all French ships from the battle arrived from Martinique in which then numbered 26 ships and were soon joined by 12 Spanish ships. Disease then took a hold of the French forces in particular the soldiers in which thousands died. The Allies now hesitated and indecision soon led to the abandonment of the enterprise upon Jamaica. The battle has caused controversy ever since, for three reasons. Rodney's failure to follow up the victory by a pursuit was much criticised. Samuel Hood said that the 20 French ships would have been captured had the commander-in-chief maintained the chase. 120 years later, the Navy Records Society published the dispatches and letters relating to the blockading of Brest. In the introduction they include a small biography of Admiral William Cornwallis who commanded the Canada at the Saints. A poem purportedly written by him includes the lines, Had a chief worthy Britain commanded our fleet, twenty-five good French ships had been laid at our feet. The battle is famous for the innovative tactic of breaking the line, in which the British ships pass through a gap in the French line, engaging the enemy from leeward and throwing them into disorder. There is however considerable controversy about whether the tactic was intentional, and, if so, who was responsible for the idea. Rodney, his Scottish captain of the fleet and aide-de-camp Sir Charles Douglas or John Clark of Eldon arguably the battle was not the first time a line had been broken. Dano Norwegian Admiral Niels Juel did this in the Battle of Kodja Bay more than a hundred years earlier and even earlier the Dutch. Admiral Michiel de Reuter used it for the first time in the last day of the Four Days Battle in 1666. On the French side, de Grasse blamed his subordinates, Vaudreuil and Bougainville, for his defeat. Nevertheless, France and Spain's plan to invade Jamaica were ruined, and it remained a British colony with no further threat, as indeed were Barbados, St. Louis, and Antigua. Rodney was fated a hero on his return. He presented the Comte de Grasse as his prisoner personally to the king. 
He was created a peer with £2,000 a year settled on the title in perpetuity for this victory. Hood was elevated to the peerage as well while Drake and Affleck were both made a baronet. Following the Franco-American victory at Yorktown the previous year, and the change of government in England, peace negotiations between Britain, the American colonies, France and Spain had begun in early 1782. The Battle of the Saints transferred the strategic initiative to the British, with the most likely further military action being an attack on the French Sugar Islands, and the French, in particular, were consequently inclined to ameliorate their terms. Britain's dominance at sea was reasserted and it also became clear to the Americans that they could look forward to less French support in the future. The siege of Gibraltar exacerbated this. When later in the year the defeat of the huge Franco-Spanish assault and the subsequent relief by Richard Howe led to the lifting of the siege in February 1783, initial articles of peace were signed in July, with a full treaty in September 1783. As a result of the battle naval warfare changed along the tactical lines employed and would be used again by the British including in the all-important Battle of Trafalgar, where Admiral Horatio Nelson defeated Napoleon's fleet using similar tactics. Order of Battle Britain France Bibliography Douglas, Major General Sir Howard, Christopher J. Vallon, Naval Evolutions, A Memoir, Fireship Press ISBN 1-935585-27-4. Dull. Jonathan R. The French Navy and American Independence. A Study of Arms and Diplomacy, 1774-1787. Princeton University Press. ISBN 9780691069814. Crossman, Mark World Military Leaders. A Biographical Dictionary Facts on Filing, ISBN 978-0-8160-4732-1. Fulham, S.W., Life of General Sir Howard Douglas, Bart. Lebed of A.A., From the Chesapeake to Dominica. The Culmination of a Fundamental Dispute Naval Doctrines. Gengat. 2010. 56-57. Mayen, A.T. Major Operations of the Navies in the War of Independence. Mayen, A.T. Types of Naval Officers, drawn from the history of the British Navy. Mundy, Major General Godfrey Basil, The Life and Correspondence of the Late Admiral Lord Rodney. Lavery, Brian. Empire of the Seas. How the Navy Forged the Modern World. Conway. ISBN 9781844816. O'Shocknessy, Andrew. The Men Who Lost America. British Command During the Revolutionary War and the Preservation of the Empire. One World Publications. ISBN 9781780789789. Playfair, John. On the Naval Tactics of the Late John Clark, ESQ. Iveldon, The Works of John Playfair, Volume 3. Rogozinski, Jan. A Brief History of the Caribbean. From the Arawak and the Carib to the Present. Facts on File. ISBN 9780816038819. Roche, Jean Michel. Dictionnaire des bâtiments de la flotte de guerre française de Colbitanos Jerzwan. Group Ritos Almori Milau. ISBN 978-2-9525917-0-6-0. CLC 165892922. Stevens, William. History of Sea Power, Volume 95 of Historische Schifffahrt. Books on Demand. ISBN 9783861996. True. Peter. 
Rodney and the Breaking of the Line, Pen and Sword Military, ISBN 9781844192. Trouder, On Essimo Akim, Bataille Navales de la France 2, Chalamelani Acute, Valen, Christopher J., Fortune's Favorite, Sir Charles Douglas and the Breaking of the Line, Fireship Press, ISBN 1-934757-721.